Is everybody seeing and hearing? Perfectly. Right. This evening, I'll be talking about uh, interaction, which involves bees, birds, and people. But I won't be giving very much time to the bees. Now, this was actually stimulated by an inter uh, a recent webinar, which I saw a presentation by Claire Spottiswood, who I will introduce later. But I realized that I had interacted with quite a lot of the people involved in the story over the years. And I had also been guided by honey guides. So let's first of all introduce the birds. The honey guides are a small family of birds. There are 15 species in Africa and two in Asia. This one illustrated here is one of the Asian honey guides, the yellow rumped, which is probably the most brightly colored of them. And this is the only one of the two Asian species on which there has been some field work done. In many of the Asian bees, they build freestanding nests, as you can see on the right of the screen here, where the combs are exposed. And the yellow rumped honey guide, the males actually set up a territory around some of these combs and they defend them against other males and females to get access to the comb and eat beeswax have to mate with the male. So it's a very much a resource-based mating system. But apart from those studies, there seems to be very little known about the two Asian honey guides. We do know that the group as a whole, their closest relatives are the woodpeckers. This is based on recent genetic work. And they share with the woodpeckers and barbets and some other bird families the characteristic of two toes forward, two toes back, which is in contrast to many perching birds which have one toe opposed by three toes. Many of the African species are forest birds which are very poorly known. The lyre tailed honey guide is quite famous for its very distinctive display. And this at least has caught sufficient attention that Central African country of Gabon has featured the lyre-tailed honey guide on one of its stamps, as you see here. So this bird has a flight display above the canopy in which this lyre tail of the male is very prominently displayed. Within Africa, there are two distinct groups. There are the typical honey guides, and there are what we call the honey birds. The honey birds are rather like little flycatchers. As you can see here, the brown backed honey bird has a typical pointed flycatcher type bull, very unlike the rather stubby bulls of the other honey guides. But they eat scale insects which contain a large amount of waxy material. As you know, if you're crushing scale insects in your garden, there's a very small bit of insect and a large amount of wax. So clearly they can also digest the wax. But it seems that they are not attracted to beeswax and don't typically eat it. They brood parasites of warblers and various birds which build an open cup nest and the chicks kill their nestmates. There are only three species in Africa. This is the most widespread and best known. The brown-backed honeybird, which in older field guides is referred to as the sharp board honey guide. Now there are three Eastern Cape species of honey guide. This is the region where I am, just in case anyone is unfamiliar with the divisions of South Africa. I've put a little map in the corner here. So we're right down at the southern tip of Africa and Grahamstown, now known as Makanda in the Eastern Cape is the base for the university at which I taught for many years. 
and I'm just a little bit south of that sitting on the coast this evening. These three Eastern Cape species have been better studied than any of the others. And we tend to extrapolate from what we know about them to the other honey guides. So they share the fact that they're all insectivorous, that they can eat and digest beeswax. And a characteristic of all the honey guides is these white outer tail feathers, which is very nicely illustrated in the lesser honey guide. The males call from traditional sites and the call of the lesser honey guide So a rather unimaginative and monotonous call. There is a call site within one street of my house, and I'm actually quite glad that it's not in my garden. What is very interesting when we say traditional call sites, there is a call site of Lesser Honey Guide on a farm which I have visited for the first time some 40 years ago. And every summer, there are lesser honey guides calling there. I'm fairly sure it's not the same individual bird every time, but the same tree has been used for a very long period. Now, they brood parasites of whole nesting birds, and the chicks kill their nest mates. So as with some cuckoos, this is not someone you want coming into your nest. Here, courtesy of Lynette, we have an array of the hosts of Lesser Honey Guide. You'll see that they're organized in groups. At the top, we have some woodpeckers and a wryneck, a series of barbets, a series of starlings. All of these are tree hole nesters, with the exception of one of the starlings, which typically nests in holes in banks. Sorry. Uh, and then an array of other birds, some of which are tree hole nesters, some of which are more burrow nesters. So the Lesser Honey Guide has quite an extensive host repertoire. Then we have the Scaly Throated Honey Guide. This is primarily a forest species. Again, the males call from traditional call sites but it has a very different call to the lesser honey guide and to the greater. Again, I know a site in the Alexandria forest, which is just a little to the west. The scaly throated, all right. So did we hear the call of the scaly throated? Very insect-like call. Right, just, just to repeat, the, there were old records of guiding by scaly throated, but these have not been confirmed in the last 80 years. So these may rest on a misidentification. As we'll see in a moment, the female greater honey guide looks very like a scaly throated. These are the known hosts of scaly throated woodpeckers and barbets, and very much forest species, as one might expect from the habitat of the bird. 
Now we come to the species which is going to be the focus of our attention here, the greater honey guide. The adult male is a very distinctive bird with this pink bill, which is a very rare characteristic in birds generally, and in the dark throat and white ear coverts. They also call from traditional sites. There we go. This is often referred to as the victor call. And from direct observations at these calling sites, it's clear that more than one male uses the same site. Even in the course of a single day, you may have different birds there. Whether they have any organized time sharing and so on, we don't fully understand at this stage but it's clear that these sites are used over generations because many of them have been known for a very long time. Again, they are brood parasites, and here's an array of their hosts. In this case, it's quite a mixture of different nest sites. So apart from typical woodpeckers and barbets and tits, which are, and some of the starlings, which are whole nesters, there are also a number of burrow nesters, kingfisher, marten, and bee eaters, which nest in sandbanks or riverbanks. We've referred several times to the young killing their nest mates. And this extraordinary series of photographs produced by Claire Spottiswood in a recent publication shows exactly how this happens. They were able to photograph in the nest. So you can see the chick hatching with very large bull hooks. And this blind chick then blunders around the nest and bites anything it encounters. So it kills nestlings holes, eggs, and as you can see on the right, any incautiously inserted finger will also be attacked. But after about a week, these hooks have shrunk and they finally are resorbed and disappear completely. So they're only present during that first week of life. These the photographs are very recent, but the first photographs were actually taken many years ago. And we know that this is the case for, that these bullhooks are present on all three of the Eastern Cape species, lesser, scaly-throated, and greater honey guide. And we assume that this applies equally to other honey guides, but at this stage, the nestlings of many species have never been examined. So the greater honey guide is the only species in which guiding has been confirmed by recent observations. Here you can see the male on the left, the female in the center, and the subadult or juvenile bird on the right. Juvenile is very distinctive with the greater contrast between the dark back and the white underside, and then this buffy wash on the throat and chest. And you can see that, as I suggested, the female greater honey guide is not very different in plumage to a scaly throated. The greater is the biggest of these species. These birds would be about the size of a thrush, whereas the lesser honey guide, for instance, is typically sparrow sized and you might mistake for a sparrow. And we do know that both males, females and juveniles are involved in guiding episodes in the greater honey guide. One interesting thing which has come out from recent research using genetic 
investigations has been that there are two distinct genetic lineages in greater honey guide. There are females who parasitize tree hole nesters. One might have assumed that this was related to an imprinting like process where the bird would seek out nests of the type that it grew up in. And a second female lineage which parasitizes burrow nesters. So here we have those illustrated typical hosts, black collared barbet and white fronted bee eater. Now turning to the guiding, the first published information on guiding came from a book written by a Portuguese missionary who had worked in Mozambique for a number of years. And he, on his return to Portugal, he wrote a book entitled Eastern Africa. Ethiopia was for a long time used as a term to refer to Africa south of the Sahara. And it was only later when Ethiopia became once again the name of a country that people stopped referring to the Ethiopian region as a biogeographic unity and started referring to the Afrotropical as Africa south of the Sahara plus bits like Southern Arabia and Madagascar. Anyhow, Dos Santos, unlike some of the early travelers and missionaries, was not terribly interested in natural history. Perhaps more appropriately, he was interested in the language and culture of the people amongst whom he was working. But he was intrigued by these funny little birds who would fly into his church and eat, try to eat the candles. Now, in a typical Catholic church of the time, the candles would, of course, have been beeswax candles. And in his comments, he made two very important points. He said he had asked the people about these birds, and they said, oh, yes, these are the birds that eat beeswax. And they told him that they would follow these birds who would guide them to bees' nests, and they could then take the honey out, but they would always leave some wax for the birds, some comb for the birds. So the two very important things that emerged from his account, which were often neglected later, were first of all, that these birds flew into a building when the candles were lit. How did they detect these were beeswax? This must have been by smell. And yet for many years, all the ornithological textbooks said that birds had virtually no sense of smell and one could disregard this. It wasn't until the 1960s that anatomists actually looked at bird brains and said, well, hang on. In some cases, the olfactory region is quite large. And this certainly suggests that at least some birds are using scent information to a considerable degree. And if you look at the close up on the left here of the lesser honey guide's head, you will see that the nostrils are a strange shape. They are very prominent, they are tubular, and they are quite different to the nostrils of many other birds, which are a simple slit in the side of the beak. And if we think of other birds, which are now known to have a very good sense of smell, like the so-called tube nose swimmers, the albatross and petrels, we realize that this is an immediate indication that they may be using scent to detect things which are important in their lives. For many years at the university in Grahamstown, my colleague Randall Hepburn was working on bees and he was intrigued by the honey guides which would fly into a storage space he used for bee frames, which was completely dark. And the only access was by missing air brick near the roof. 
yet he would quite often enter there to find honey guides in the room feeding on wax frames. He was working at one point with numerous colleagues from Asia, and he had large samples of Asian bee comb as well. And he had also done studies on the composition of the wax. And chemically, it's different in different bee species. So he put some of these combs out for honey guides. The only species which they directly observed feeding on it were lesser honey guides. But what was very interesting was that the bees did not discriminate between African and Asian beeswax. They would take any beeswax and remodel it and use it in their combs. But the honey guides would only eat the African beeswax and they avoided any parts which had been, as it were, contaminated by Asian beeswax being added. And they completely ignored combs of pure Asian beeswax. So clearly they have discriminating sense of taste and smell. The first written records of a guiding episode were by the Swedish naturalist Anders Sparman. As you can see from his dates, he was actually a contemporary of Linnaeus and he visited South Africa collecting material and wrote a very interesting account of his travels here. He recorded a guiding episode and he noted the very distinctive call which the bird use when guiding. He wrote how the local people who accompanied him immediately recognized this call and said, this bird will take us to honey. And he reported how the bird fluttered ahead of them, calling regularly, and that the people responded, calling or whistling back to the bird. And that finally, when the honey guide reached the tree where the beehive was, that it fell silent. So this has been the experience of everyone who has uh, followed honey guides since then. He also wrote that honey guides guided both people and honey badgers, which are better known as rattles here. But it was clear that this was just something he'd been told. He never saw a live rattle because in his account of the animal, he wrote that he had been given a skin on which his description was based and that he'd been unable to collect one himself. Other travelers, Johann Wahlberg, those of you who know South African birds will recognize the name, Wahlberg's eagle is named for him. He recorded following honey guides in many different parts of the country, and it was clearly a sort of everyday occurrence. So you have a terse journal entry as listed here saying, found three bees nests with help of an indicator. Now one would have liked to have had a bit more detail as to whether he thought it was the same honey guide that had led him to three different nests in the course of a day or how far apart these incidents were. Unfortunately, he never got to write a full account of his travels. He was not well funded in his collecting trips and consequently he collected ivory as well to add extra income. And it was this that brought his downfall because he'd wounded an elephant and was following it up and the elephant killed him. So he was killed by an elephant in Botswana. An important step in studying the honey guides was a monograph on this family. This was typically done by people in museums. So Herbert Friedman, was curator of birds at the Smithsonian in Washington. 
He had collected birds in Africa. And when preparing this account of both the taxonomy and the biology of all members of the honey guide family, as was known at the time, he actually came to South Africa and spent some time in the field with two very fine naturalists, both of whom I had the privilege of meeting. Gordon Ranger had taken the very first photographs of the bull hooks of honey guides and recorded their brood parasitism. He also had kept honey guides in captivity and demonstrated that you could feed them only beeswax and they survived for more than a week, although they lost weight. Jack Skeed was for many years my neighbor and was a friend and mentor over a very long period in his long career. So with Herbert Friedman, they did some simple field experiments and they showed that the honey guides, given a choice, would take dry comb rather than comb with honey and would also prefer dry comb to comb with bee larvae in it. Many people had assumed that the bee larvae were the main attractant, but clearly it was actually the wax. And they also demonstrated that the call sites were used by a number of different individuals and that both males, females, and subadults were involved in guiding episodes. Friedman was interested in the story of Sparman that honey badgers or rattles were guided by honey guides. And he tried very hard to collect direct observations of this. And he commented that it was surprising that there seemed to be so little information about this. But he collected a few observations which he felt demonstrated that it probably did occur. And he also wrote a popular article, which was then illustrated by artists in National Geographic magazine. And here are two of the plates from that article. One shows a scene which many of us have actually seen in our gardens in this region, a lesser honey guide being chased away from a nest hole by black collared barbets. Lesser honey guide is the most common species in our area. And they often parasitize black collared barbets, which will use nest boxes also. And then this illustration of a rattle at a nest with a bee's nest, which it's opened with a honey guide in attendance. So very soon this honey guide, honey badger story became well established. Biologists, are often quite widely read, and they also have a sense of humor. Archibiscus theorem is represented as it's a fact that the whole world knows. Now, many of you may have encountered Edward Lear, who is a very fine bird artist, but also well known for his limericks and nonsense items. The Owl and the Pussycat is a, a very famous little poem by him. But he wrote another poem about the pobble who has no toes. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole poem here, but the pobble used to have toes, of which he was inordinately proud. And he was devastated when in an unfortunate accident, he lost his toes. But he was comforted by his aunt Jabiska, who with great authority stated, it's a fact that the whole world knows that pobbles are happier without their toes. And this with a combination of scones and jam evidently comforted the pobble. So although even Friedman found not a great deal of evidence for the honey guide guiding honey badgers, this soon became established in the literature. 
for a long time, we didn't know very much about the erratal. But then some research was done in the Kalahari over several years. And they found a very interesting association there. The rattles there often go out by day. They're great diggers. And they will dig up gerbil and other rodent burrows. And of course, if they hit a gold mine, as it were, and a very active burrow system, then there are going to be a lot of rodents scattering in different directions. So these foraging rattles are typically accompanied by a chanting goshawk, who's pretty sure that as the rodents scatter, he will get some. And there's very often a jackal following as well. I have actually seen this interaction in, in a couple of different places in the arid regions of Southern Africa. So this association was well known. And the people doing this study then moved to an area of Mozambique where honey guides actually occurred. There are no honey guides in the Kalahari where they'd worked previously. So they were very interested in the idea that there might be an association between the rattle and the honey guide. They then uh, worked for several years. And at the end of this time, they came to the simple conclusion, which many naturalists had suggested, that this was actually a myth. But there is some interaction. They found that the honey badger, the rattle, shows no interest at all in the honey guide. But the honey guides may follow the rattles in the hope, apparently, that they will actually open a bee's nest for them. Now, if you go onto the internet, which is a wonderful source of information, but also a profound source of misinformation in many cases, you will find many sites which will refer to this wonderful collaboration between the honey guide and the honey badger. When the site tells you that these two animals share common interest in honey, you know, they haven't done even the most basic background reading because it's been known for a long time that the honey guides don't eat honey. They are interested in the wax. And you will find sites on YouTube which purport to show honey guides guiding rattles. I've looked at a few of these and they seem to follow a common pattern. And I suspect maybe recycling the same rather poor quality video clips. They open with some shots of a bird, which is a honey guide perched in a tree. Then you see a rattle running along and various birds flutter briefly into view. This is quite tricky, but I have not been able to establish that any of the birds which flutter above the rattle are actually honey guides. And in some cases, they are very clearly not. In one case, it was a woodland kingfisher, and it, which is a bright blue bird, unlike any known honey guide. And in the other case, it was certainly a drongo. I suspect that the birds fluttering into the picture are birds nesting in the area which are concerned about this rather nasty predator passing through their territory and are trying to chivy it along to make sure it doesn't stay and start doing any investigations. Then at the end of the sequence, you will have a picture of the rattle at a bee's nest, which it has opened, and a honey guide perched nearby. Yes, that does happen. It would seem that the, of all the observations which have been recorded are perfectly interpreted by the assumption that honey guides are actually following the rattle on occasion. And because honey guides guide people, everyone assumed that if you see the two animals in the same frame, oh, the rattle is following the honey guide. But there is no evidence 
that this is the case. So proper research on the honey guides started in the 1980s with Hussein Isaac, who was working in Kenya, and then currently is very active research by Claire Spotterswood, who grew up in South Africa. I first met her when she was a formidably bright young student. She now holds a joint chair at UCT and at Cambridge University and has a very active research profile in Africa. She started her research on the honey guides from the point of view of brood parasitism, but has since expanded it, working with other colleagues on the whole question of the human honey guide interaction. But let's start first of all with Hussein. I met Hussein in the early 80s. Now, because he was a Kenyan and I was a South African, and these two countries were very far apart in the apartheid days, this happened at an international conference. Over a couple of beers one evening, we sorted out our political positions and we remained in contact so that when he first visited South Africa, some years later, he stayed with us, lectured to our students, and we went out to look for honey guides together. We did find them giving the Victor call, but we didn't actually get guided on that occasion. So Hussein came from an area where there were traditional honey hunters who followed the honey guides. And in this area, the people called to the birds using a whistle, which was maybe amplified by snail shells, as illustrated down here. And the Boran honey hunters said that the bird's behavior told them three things. First of all, the direction of the beehive. Secondly, the distance. And thirdly, the bird's behavior changed dramatically when it arrived at the site. So Hussein started a proper scientific investigation of these predictions. And sure enough, the direction in which the birds fly indicates the direction of the hive and the distance that they fly. They fly ahead of you, fluttering, and then perch, calling, and then fly on again. So that distance reflects the, dis the total distance that you're going to have to travel. So if they stop frequently, it indicates a short distance, whereas if the, dis the distances between the pauses are greater, this indicates that the hive is much further away. And when they reach the site, they call briefly and then sit silent in the tree and don't move again. And that is an indication that you've arrived. And he was able to confirm these. There were some other predictions which initially he suspected were true, but was not able to confirm immediately. Claire's group have worked mainly at two sites, one in northern Tanzania. The people there use a complex whistle, so a little tune which they whistle. And they put out only a small reward for the honey guides. Their argument being that if the honey guide doesn't receive too much at one go, it will be more ready to guide you again on another occasion. Then they've been working in northern Mozambique. Here the people imitate the guiding call and they provide a much more generous award. Now the point about the honey hunters is that honey guides will approach people giving the guiding call. If the people show no interest, they then give up and move away. So the honey hunters have a specific response to the honey guide to indicate, yes, we serious honey hunters 
we will follow you. And they keep communicating with the bird as they move along. But it's clear that these Communication forms can be a whistle involving a snail shell, they can be a little tune, or they can be imitations of the guiding call. It can be a variety of different cultural traditions, but the hunting guides and the people have both learned these. So uh, Claire's group found that if they played the complex whistle from Northern Tanzania and Northern Mozambique, the bird showed no particular interest. They responded most vigorously to the guiding response, which they were used to from the local people. So learning by both sides. The size of the reward seems to be less important. Now, how long has this association been going on. We, of course, have no accurate records of this. The archaeologists and anthropologists argue about this. There are claims that people have first used and controlled fire a million years ago. But certainly the association between people and honey guides in Africa is likely to be very ancient. And it is regionally different. There are areas where there is no tradition of people following honey guides and where honey guides don't give the guiding call when people enter their areas. So it is something that has been established by close association. What would the origin of this be? I suspect from the type of call that the guiding call is that it was originally an alarm call. So a response to an alien animal, potential predator coming into the territory. And that the bird simply followed this person chattering, hoping they'd go away. And then from observing that the person might actually open beehives and make beeswax available to them, that they then began the gradual process from a few individuals of, of guiding. Now, when the beehive has actually been opened, you get scroungers arriving. So other honey guides of different species, for instance, lesser honey guide, which doesn't guide at all, or other greater honey guide individuals arrive. So why should you go through the trouble of actually guiding someone to a bee's nest when all you need to do is actually follow along quietly and then get the benefits? Claire's group have been very innovative in following individual birds now. And what do you do these days? You get a cell phone app. So they're honey hunters are issued with an app on a cell phone, which they can start when a guiding episode begins. This records in detail the route taken, the time involved, and they can then add other details like, was this a particularly rich hive? Was it an adult or an immature bird? And any other information. So it seems that there are some birds who guide much more frequently than others. And the same individual may guide on some occasions or arrive as a scrounger who hasn't been involved in the guiding episode. But the bird that has guided and is the first on the scene does do substantially better in terms of the amount of beeswax that it obtains. And you've got to be quick because there are other scroungers in that area, Northern Mozambique, for instance, Civet and Rattle are around. And if they get to an open beehive, they will very quickly eat everything that is available. 
and leave very little for the bird. So one of the open questions is, will guiding actually disappear if no one responds? Honey is not necessarily an important resource anymore. People can buy sugar at the shop. It's not the only source of sweetening available and may not even be the preferred source. In the left-hand picture there, you can see one of Claire's team with a honey guide which has been trapped for marking. So that they're following individuals. And on the right, you can see an example of a very generous portion of beeswax comb which has been put out for the birds after a successful raid on a hive. There are suggestions that in many areas, guiding calls are heard much less frequently than in the past. It's always very difficult to quantify this. I went back through my diaries and I found that I've been guided at two sites on several different occasions. Both of these sites are in reserves and at both localities for different reasons, one is now no longer free to walk on foot. In the one case, because lions have been introduced to that reserve and in the other case, because of rhino poaching incidents. So the last occasion on which I was guided by a honey guide, and I'm sorry to say that I did not have any equipment to open the hive for it, nor was I prepared to climb the crons and get stung. The, the, those were some 12 years ago, but I have heard several people recount recent guiding episodes. And in some of these rural communities, there is still a strong tradition of honey hunting and a continuation of this interaction. So to summarize, the honey guides, only a single African species, the greater honey guide guides people and there's no good evidence that it guides any other animals. It appears that all the honey guides can eat and digest beeswax. Even this aspect of their physiology is not fully explained. It seems that there are uh, symbiotic microorganisms in the gut which assist in digesting the wax but it also seems that there may be enzymes which are responsible. At least some of the honey guides have a good sense of smell. We did a very simple experiment in our community where we got members of our bird club to put out beeswax in their gardens at their bird feeders. In all four gardens, within a few days, Lesser honey guide, as illustrated here, came to feed at these sites. And two of the gardens, greater honey guides also came there. So it's clear that the birds are around. They are very much attracted to beeswax. It's perhaps not an essential element in their diet. And it may well be that it's almost an addiction like we would eat chocolate if we can get it, but it's not necessary to us. We can digest it and gain some benefit from it, but it, it's, it's a luxury item. And maybe beeswax is just something like that to honey guides. As far as we know, all members of the family are assumed to be brood parasites, but for many of the species, we actually have very little information at this stage. So it's certainly a group where there's great scope for further research and a whole lot of questions which would be very interesting to follow up.
Right, so I'll be happy to try and answer any questions. I would just like to acknowledge the inspiration from Claire Spottiswood, who got me looking back at the history of this whole episode and my own records. Warwick Tarbiton and Lynette Rudman and a few others have very generously allowed me to use photographs which they've provided. I haven't taken any of the photographs in this presentation myself. Right. Um, so. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. That was very informative. Um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. It was great. Um, if there are any questions, please um, post them in the chat box. Um, Lloyd um, just mentioned, he said, great topic. Lucky in Bryanston Garden last year, lesser parasitized black collared barbet nest. Later, a crested barbet nest got taken by bees that lesser than juvenile greater raided and fed. That's quite exciting to have a garden with so much action. Um, okay, and then Krista was asking you, um, Adrian, wow, that's wild. I wonder if something similar happens with other brood parasites outside honey guides. I think what she meant was that the chicks kill the host's chicks. Um, Adrian, maybe you could talk about that. Yes. Uh... In, in some of the cuckoos, it does. So in the, the classic European cuckoo, for instance, on hatching, the chick throws out of the nest anything else that's in with it. And that occurs in a certain groups of cuckoos. In some of the others, the chicks don't displace the host young but they tend to outcompete them. So there's usually a loss of host young through that. But the one group in which there seems to be very little disadvantage are the widers, which parasitize the wax balls. There the chicks are often reared together. And although the parents have to work rather harder to feed some extra mouths, it seems that only when food is in really short supply is there any disadvantage to the host. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks. And then Angela said, wow, fascinating. Images from that study on the previous page were featured in a funny YouTube video on parasitic birds. If anyone is interested for later, and then she posts the YouTube link to that video. So if you'll go and look at that. Um, are there any more questions? Um, I think I posted one there, Lynette, but I can ask it. Yes, please do. So um, Adrian, you mentioned two genetic lines. Uh, I think it was, was it a greater honey guide females that have two genetic, separate gene genetic lines? Is that um like a, a, are they gents like in some of the female cuckoos where they they have host specific evolutionary lineages in the females where where the genes are on the w chromosome yes yes it would seem to be that because the male the males don't have any input to to that so the nest type in the cuckoos it applies to egg color of course the females can't lay eggs of different colors so mm. they lay eggs of a particular color and type which is then specific to the birds they're parasitizing yeah so then what what would be the the the, the driver of that separate of the separation of those two lineages what would be a fascinating study there isn't there yes yes it's not obvious why there should be 
that that kind of separation but presumably it's a simpler you know, they would then be focused on searching for a particular nest type so they would be searching either in wooded areas for tree hole nests or along rivers and gullies for burrow nests oh yeah that makes sense i hadn't thought of that uh, that's fascinating would be a really interesting study just to to see that okay and then penny asks um does the beeswax provide any nutritional benefit yeah yes it it does uh, as as i mentioned they have done studies where captive birds have been fed over only beeswax and they have been kept alive for more than a week under those conditions, but they do lose weight. So it's not adequate by itself. Yeah. Uh, so, so they would supplement their diet with insects? With, with insects, in yeah. yes. So they need additional protein in that to be fully healthy. Yeah. And then Krista was um, curious which app the honey hunters use to record their data. I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I don't know. You would need to look at Claire Spottiswood's website to, to find that. Okay. And then James says, great and in, informative session. Thanks to Adrian and all the organizers. Are there any more questions before we wrap up? No questions, but um, it's given me something to look out for around here because I think I heard uh, Honey Guide calling uh, early this morning. So now I'm going to keep an eye out for it. That was a lesser one. Um, I'm going to keep an eye out for it and, and watch what it does. Um, Angela's just posted a question. Would the honey hunters eat the bee larva without any wax near? Um. Yes, uh, they, they do harvest the larvae as well as the honey in many cases. Okay. And for us, the wax is not particularly nutritious. Yeah. I, I enjoy honey in the comb with a bit of wax, but it's not something we really digest. It's quite That's chewy. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not pleasant to eat. <laughs> um, and Tari says, very interesting talk. Thank you. I think we can wrap up now. I don't think there are any more questions. Derek, do you want to add anything? No, just uh, um, you know, keep keep an eye on the Learn the Birds uh, site. There's lots of things happening, and uh, we do have uh, a webinar coming up again on the middle of next month. Um, is that uh, that is um, Melissa? Uh, yeah. Yes, there's Melissa Whitecross talking about the secretary birds, saving Africa's right. striders. So that will also be an interesting uh, webinar, I think. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. Yes, great. Thanks so much. And thanks Adrian. for joining us. Yeah, yes. Thanks so much. Thank it was very good. Thanks Thank indeed. You. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.